Hello, Paul Street. This is the Paul Street Report. It is Monday, September 16th. It's 921 in the morning. So, um, hey, by the way, folks, if you're listening to me and reading me and not paying, uh, I get it. Uh, uh, I'm glad you're listening and reading to me. If you can possibly become a paid supporter, please do so. That's how um, I can keep this thing going. Um, Into the revolution. Uh, I'm continuing on this topic today of revolution. This is the second part of what I think will be a three-part uh, series uh, on the topic. Yesterday, no, not yesterday, two days ago, it turns out, I got uh, down and dirty with the very word itself using, um, and I guess we could say interrogating Webster's online definition of the word revolution. And <clears throat> I hope that I um, did that to introduce a good part of what an actual Marxist, uh, that is a revolutionary communist, means when they say revolution. Today I want to get into why we need um, an actual revolution, a socialist revolution. Um, in my third piece, maybe tomorrow or at some point next week, I'll get into why, in my opinion, that revolution needs to be <coughs> communist in leadership and uh, orientation and say a few other things about uh, what passes for revolutionary thinking these days. Uh, one thing I want to emphasize that I uh, ran out of time for a couple days ago is that a revolution involves a bold, transforming seizure and wielding of state power. One of the standard chants you hear at left rallies in Chicago and all over the place is, the people united will never be defeated. The people united will never be defeated. Bullshit. The people can unite all they want, and of course, they should unite. And they should unite not <clears throat> just against this or that policy, this or that war, but against the whole goddamn capitalist imperialist system, right? But if their unity doesn't connect with the bold and brilliant movement to take and wield state power, doesn't succeed in that regard, well, guess what? They will be defeated. A real socialist revolution means taking over the state apparatus, including its coercive and repressive functions, and wielding them in entirely new and different ways on the path to the end of all exploitation and oppression, including not just class exploitation and class oppression, Probably in my next talk, I'll get into a little bit of this just constant reification of an obsession with class struggle and the working class. And don't get me wrong, of course I'm for class struggle. Uh, but a, social, a real socialist revolution would wield <clears throat> state power uh, in new and different ways on the path to the end of all exploitation, oppression, including not just class, but also racist oppression, gender, patriarchal oppression uh, against the destruction of livable ecology and against much more, which I'll get into. And even then, of course, after taking and seizing boldly state power on behalf of socialism, defeat can ensue and has ensued, as took place in China after the coup that essentially restored capitalism from within the, commun the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing and China in 1976. And another chant you hear a lot at left-wing rallies and marches is, this is what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. I'm always darkly amused uh, to hear that chant. I'm looking over the financial district in Chicago right now where I've heard it said many times, along with whose streets are streets, even though the streets are owned by Citigroup and Bank of America and Wind Trust. <laughs> All of that, but anyway, this is what democracy looks like, and I'm always darkly amused by it. Uh, it's commonly said by relatively small gatherings of protesters, not always small, but commonly small groups of protesters, who are literally surrounded by heavily armed riot police. And I always think, no, this is what the iron heel of class rule in capitalist state power looks like. This is what bourgeois democracy looks like. And bear in mind, in Marxist analysis to which I adhere, bourgeois democracy is the fig leaf, the outer shell of democracy, covering the uh, 
underlying class dictatorship of the bourgeoisie of capital. I mean, what's just specific about fascism and the fascist menace these days is it's ready to crash that outer shell of democracy and just go full on explicit authoritarian in this in this political superstructure. Um, and here, perhaps I'll jump a bit into my next topic by saying that if anyone thinks uh, the revolution we need is going to be a shining example of what democracy looks like, they need to think again. Uh, in 1872, Frederick Ingalls tried to set the um, anti-state left libertarians of his time, and there were a bunch in Marx and Engels followed Bakunin and other so-called anarchist thinkers. In 72, Engels tried to set them straight uh, in an essay titled On Authority. The anti-authoritarians, Frederick Engels wrote, demand that the political state be abolished at one stroke, even before the social conditions that gave birth to it have been destroyed. They demand that the first act of the social revolution shall be the abolition of authority, state authority. And then Engels asks, <laughs> I love this, have these gentlemen ever seen a revolution? A revolution is certainly the most authoritarian thing there is. Ingalls candidly says, and rightly says, it is the act whereby one part of the population imposes its will upon the other part by means of rifles, bayonets, and cannon. Authoritarian means, says Ingalls. <clears throat> If such there be at all a revolution, that is, and if the victorious party does not want to have fought in vain, it must maintain this rule by means of the terror which its arms inspire in the reactionists, that is, in the counter-revolutionaries. Would the Paris Commune have lasted a single day, wrote Ingalls, if it had not made use of this authority? Well, it lasted 71 days. Or thereabouts. Should it not, on the contrary, should we not, on the contrary, Ingalls says about the commune, reproach it for not having it used coercive state authority enough? And bear in mind, Ingalls is writing in 1872 and is therefore reflecting upon the bloody crushing and defeat of the remarkable working class proletarian Paris commune of the spring of uh, 1871, which the Thiers government literally drowned in blood with the Prussian invaders of the time outside the gate. Uh, it's not for nothing that Marx and Engels and generations of Marxist revolutionary sense have referred to the revolutionary socialist state that we need as, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat. A dictatorship is a necessary counter to the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie that is regularly visible whenever large and even sometimes small groups of leftists, progressives gather in the streets as during the recent Democratic National Convention in Chicago. I remember years ago a gathering about a mile north of here in the loop of, that couldn't have been more than uh, 75 anarchists from a neighborhood called Wicker Park and me uh, against something called the Transatlantic Business Dialogue, some gathering uh, brought together by the by the military industrial uh, complex corporation Boeing. And I, I'll never forget, there are like 75 anarchists in me and just surrounded wall to wall by um, Darth Vader-like riot cops in, uh, in, in uh, full gendarme uniform. It was uh, fascinating. One thing I remember about that day was the uh, all the horses, the police horses, uh, that, that didn't have their buckets attached so that I ended up uh, with a pair of sneakers that I was digging horseshoe, horse shit out of, literally, for the next month. Um, it's really good to be sharp and honest about this. Uh, actual revolutionaries, um, we, actual revolutionaries, are not opposed to democracy as such, but we do not fetishize bourgeois democratic norms, and we do not abstract and divorce those forms or the ideal of democracy from the class context in which those forms and the idea of democracy are materially and historically situated. 
there will be new and very different forms and understandings of democracy under the class rule of the proletariat, very different understanding and context of the, of the type of democracy that exists under the class rule of the bourgeoisie. But that rule, that new, that new socialist era democracy comes only after the fighting and winning of a revolution that will involve the bold and sometimes often coercive use of state power. A state power that will have no intention of permitting a return to the horrors of capitalism at the slightest hint that the majority of the population would like to go back to the horrors of capitalism, which may happen. Why do we need this socialist revolution, this dictatorship of the proletariat? Did I just say the horrors of capitalism? I sure as fuck did. Yes, I did. Let me be more specific. Because of what capitalism is doing to human beings, other living things, livable ecology, how capitalism makes it impossible for humanity to move beyond many-sided exploitation and oppression. I say many-sided because so many Marxists I know just seem to think everything is class, but I mean everything. Exploitation and oppression, not limited to class exploitation. That's why we need a social revolution, because of that. That's why we need a socialist revolution. The Revolutionary Communist Party USA, the Revcoms, talk about... Oh, my dog has just woken up. <laughs> I thought she was going to let me sleep through this whole thing. I may wrap up earlier and then make this a four-part series, because I can see somebody's going to want to go outside. The Revolutionary Communist Party USA talks about what they call the five stops. The five stops by which they mean five core problems that cannot be overcome under the capitalist system. You might think of these as the five things that can't be stopped under capitalism, or five things that can't be stopped under capitalism, because I actually have ten. One, the persecution, super, super exploitation of black and brown people replete with extreme racial segregation, murderous racist police brutality, and racist mass incarceration. Two, gender oppression and exploitation, the oppression of women and oppression based on gender and sexual orientation. Three, ecocide, the poisoning and indeed destruction of livable ecology of the web of life, led but uh, hardly limited to the climate catastrophe. Four, the hounding and terrorizing of immigrants. Five, imperialism, including wars, occupation, and related crimes against humanity. Now, if you ask me, those five stops, basically racism, patriarchy, ecocide, nativist terrorizing of immigrants, and imperial war. If you ask me, that's the short list. I go out to 10 stops. Six, poverty and economic insecurity for masses alongside and intimately related to grotesque and ever-increasing concentrations of wealth and power in the hands of, of the few. And intimately related to the constant economic exploitation of wage earners, that is the extraction of surplus value from the proletariat. Seven, a toxic and alienating stress and disease generating culture of competition and individualistic striving and acquisition that privileges self over the common good, that justifies savage economic hierarchy, and it is justified, so to speak, rationalized at it, with false and dark conceptions of so-called human nature as supposedly inherently competitive, egoistic, mean-spirited, and even violent. A whole sort of bourgeois concept of human nature that dates back to uh, Locke and Hobbes and up through Defoe and various other Western bourgeois theoreticians. Eight, the endless propagation of religious and other forms of magical and unscientific thinking. Nine, the recurrent generation of fascist movements parties and regimes, 
10, the lethal division of the world into a multiplicity of competing and unequal nation states incapable of confronting the species leading problems created by a capitalist order that exploits and oppresses the entire human species and the planet. I'm not sure I said that all clearly, so let me repeat. Nine is the recurrent generation of fascist movements, parties, and regimes, and ten is the division of the world into a multiplicity of competing and unequal nation states that can't pull together in a coordinated way to solve problems for humanity caused by a singular united world capitalist system, really. And actually, I just said what Emmanuel Wallerstein and the uh, world systems people consider a defining aspect of the modern capitalist order, number 10. Now, and I can tell as I look at 15 minutes that I'm going to be having four talks, not um, not three talks. Um One thing to note about these 10 problems is that they reinforce and indeed multiply each other. They're not just and, 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 and plus, you know, racism and patriarchy and imperialism and ecocide and exploitation and, you know, environment, I already said environmental ruin. And, you know, it's, they, they're all sort of caught up in a multi, mutually reinforcing simultaneous equation system of um, where, where they are, it's times each other. Um, not just plus each other. And I could give examples of this for the next hour. Obviously, we don't have time for that. Just to give uh, 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 a few examples, look at how white supremacism, racism, one of the five stops, helps divide the working class population in ways that discourage that population from rising up in solidarity against capitals. In other words, divide and rule. You know, this notion that white wage earners historically have had that at least I'm somebody. The, the, the way their, 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 their whiteness identifies them with the system that is exploiting them because at least I'm not one of them. I'm not a black or a brown person. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what W.E.B. Du Bois called the psychological wage of racism. There's also a psychological wage of patriarchy. Yeah, at least I'm somebody because I'm a man and I control my household. There's a psychological wage of, um, of empire and nationalism that is hardly exclusively white, and neither is the psychological wage of sexism. It's hardly exclusively white, obviously. At least I'm somebody. I'm part of the biggest, baddest, most powerful country in the world. Um, look at um, how um, capitalist ecocide fuels migrations that spark racist nativism while also setting off an escalated scramble for global resources that helps fuel conflicts between imperial powers. Again, feeding each other, playing uh, off each other. Look how white supremacism helps fuel mass support for imperial wars and occupations inflicted on non-white and therefore supposedly inherently inferior and unworthy people in nations abroad. Look at how racism, sexism, magical thinking, economic insecurity, imperial militarism, and savage socioeconomic hierarchy, and more, and also dark conceptions of human nature, all can shield together to create the uh, toxic authoritarianism of fascism, which is a superstructural form of modern capitalism, minus the pretense of electoral and rule of law democracy. I, you know, I might have added an 11th stop, pandemicide, and I didn't because I just didn't want to have too many numbers, but I might have added an 11th stop thing that can't be stopped under capitalism, pandemicide, which is intimately related uh, to ecocide, since the current era of zoonotic, zoonotic virus transmission is all tied up with how capitalist generated climate change and capitalist growth addiction is tearing up previous natural boundaries um, between species and 
diseases that those species carry. Why can't these ter 10 terrible things be stopped under capitalism? Well, sorry for all the numbers here. Four reasons. First, some of these contradictions, these problems, these stops, these things that can't be stopped under capitalism are literally definitional of capitalism itself. Like, like asking capitalism to stop doing them is asking capitalism to stop being capitalist. And that's certainly true about the problems concentrated in stops six and seven above, that is poverty, economic insecurity, the concentration of wealth, exploitation and surplus value extraction and the toxic culture of alienation and competition. It's just baked in to capitalism. That shit's baked into the profit system. Ecocide and imperialism, while neither is invented by capitalism, in my opinion, uh, are largely inherent in capitalism because that system has from its very origins in the long 16th European century relied on the ruthless, heedless exploitation of nature as well as of human labor power. Of course, some people would tell you that human labor power is part of nature, and there's some truth in that. And it has also relied on and required consistently throughout its history, territorial expansion and conquest. The system by its very nature requires the takeover and expansion of its territorial sphere. So that's that's the first reason. A lot of this shit you, you can't you can't get rid of it under capitalism because it is it is cap. It's inherent to capitalism. Second, uh, the the second thing is that. Problems that capitalism didn't invent, so to speak, have nonetheless become essential components of modern day capitalism, imperialism, things upon which that system relies, regardless of their pre-capitalist origins. This is certainly true of racism, certainly true of patriarchy, certainly true of nativism and nationalism and magical thinking an imperial war, none of which are inventions of capitalism, but all of which are incorporated into, transformed by, and internalized as essential components of modern capitalism. Third, capitalism's uh, ruling classes and the many governments they and their system condition, control, and cripple don't give a flying fuck about anything but private profit for the investor class. They are not about to dedicate surplus economic and social capital to tackling massive social and ecological problems like racial inequality, racial oppression, like patriarchy, like climate collapse, like educational breakdown, like fill in the fucking blank. They don't care. Of all these five or ten, if you like, stops, things that can't be stopped under capitalism, the two most urgent ones right now are numbers three, ecocide, and five, imperial war. In an age of potential runaway climate catastrophe and rising nuclear armed inter-imperial conflict, with both of those problems, stops, contradictions, whatever you want to call them, ecocide and nuclear war, reinforcing each other. In an age of ecocide and escalating imperial war, runaway ecocide potentially, um, the very survival of humanity now is at stake, really like never before. Uh, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists Doomsday Clock is closer to midnight than it has ever been. Uh, it turns out that the post-Cold War movement moment is much more dangerous than the Cold War era ever was, and I think this is thanks to how the global capitalist anarchic forces that were unleashed by capital's full reclaiming of vast swaths of territory, swaths of territory that were previously 
significantly insulated from full capitalist exploitation, commodification, alienation, all that. The, 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 the post-Cold War has opened up huge new swaths of the world, China, Russia, to capitalist exploitation um, in, in ways that have created a more dangerous world. You know, I, I get it. The October miss, the missile crisis and the next month that's coming up in October was, was about as close as we came to annihilation as ever. And there were nuclear war moments in this, you know, under Nixon in the 70s and under Reagan in the 80s. But this is this feels different. Um, and the bulletin of atomic scientists seems to agree. I guess that's it for today. We'll see if I can finish my little revolution series in uh, three talks. I may have to go to four. My next topic is why... Uh, the, the desirable socialist revolution we need to move off, off this mess needs to be communist in leadership and in orientation. And then I want to get into what qualifies as desirably revolution um, in that regard, and especially um, what does not. Oh, my goodness, 26 minutes. My apologies.